Praise the Lord. Welcome to a special episode of Mom Focus. This will be an exclusive question and answer session, questions related to parenting teenagers. These questions we received in the last Mom Focus meeting, which was on parenting teenagers by Professor Alexander George. We answered a few questions live in that session, but we had so many more questions left over after the meeting. So we decided to do this recording to answer all your questions. So with us, we have today, Dr. Alexander George. He's a retired professor from the Kerala Agricultural University, and he has been a pastor and mentor for so many years now. He's a much sought after, after counselor, teacher, and uh, he specializes in parenting topics and also on premarital seminars. Uncle, welcome you once again to this meeting. We are indeed glad you could spare your time again for us. It is our privilege to have you with us today. Thank so you very much. Go, Sash, so shall we go to the question and answers now? Sure. Okay. So the first question, how do I help my child learn to practice modesty when she sees different standards in different believing homes? We have another question on the same topic. Modesty standards differ in different homes, even among believers. From scripture, how can we teach our teens what true modesty is? These are very practical questions and uh... We must teach our children to differentiate between the unchanging principles in scripture and the changing application of those principles in non-moral areas. For example, the unchanging principle is found in the non in First Timothy 2:9. We must adorn ourselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation. In the application of this principle, each church and each family can set down more specific rules. However, the person or the family who sets these rules must be able to explain why the rule has been set. These rules will vary from home to home, from church to church, from era to era, and from country to country. Colossians chapter 2, verse 20 to 23, reminds us that these rules are man-made. They have an appearance of wisdom and that they keep changing with the passage of time. Just to illustrate, in the mid 1980s, when my wife started going for church meetings, sari was the only accepted dress for women in a Bible-based church in Kerala. Later on, the salwar kameez became acceptable. Some churches still do not allow jeans, while other churches consider tithes as taboo. So these norms keep changing. In some churches, the baptism candidate may turn up in a Bermuda, while for other churches, that attire may be offensive. So we must teach our teenagers that these norms will definitely vary from home to home, from church to church, from country to country, and from one era to another. That is a reality. Yet, they must learn to submit to the authority that God has placed over them, be it in the church or at home. We must also be careful 
that our dress does not bring offense to the faith. The parents and the church authorities on their part should be careful about the rules that they try to enforce. A principle from Acts chapter 15 verse 10 is not to put on their congregation a yoke that is too hard to bear. Matthew chapter 11 verse 29 and 30 tells us that the yoke of Christ is always light and easy to bear. The guiding principle is to dress for the occasion such that you do not attract attention because of the dress that you wear. It must neither be too outdated nor too flaunty. In this matter, as with other areas of life, the parents must be role models to children. We cannot impose on children what we ourselves do not follow. For those of you who desire a more detailed answer, I would suggest that you look at two articles that I have posted in my blog. My blog's name is Maturity Foundation. And the two articles that I'm referring to are entitled uh, Fig Leaves and Drawing Lines in Modesty of Dress. Uh, thank you, Uncle. So just a note, there will be a few articles referred to in our discussion today. The link for all these articles will be in the description box of this video on YouTube. So you can click those links and you can directly access these articles. Moving on to the next question. My young adult daughter is very influenced by worldly thinking of feminism egalitarianism, etc. She thinks the Bible is irrelevant to women's problems. How can I help her? While it is true that the patriarchal culture was predominant in the Old Testament times and in the Jewish culture at the time when Jesus Christ came to live among us humans, we must appreciate that it was Jesus Christ who broke the existing stereotypes to give dignity and status to women. He allowed women to interact with him in public. He took the initiative to talk to the Samaritan woman, even to the surprise of his own disciples. He had a platonic relationship with the family at Bethany which consisted of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Women were an integral part of his ministry support system. Women were present at the cross and for his burial. And his resurrection was first announced to a woman. That being so, we must ask ourselves, how much have we continued that work which Jesus Christ began in giving back to women the dignity and space that rightly belonged to them. To what extent has the patriarchal culture that has very much been a part of our Indian system kept us from doing so? So I would suggest that it would be good for you to listen to your daughter and try to calibrate your own position, which may have been skewed by the culture, the church, the family that you were brought up in. As you study the subject in an unbiased way, you may be able to come up with why you take the position that you do. To be able to relate with your daughter from such a position of true awareness, can make a lot of difference. You have mentioned that your daughter is now a young adult. 
so she has the freedom to hold her own views in this regard she is accountable to god for what she believes in you need to give her that space when you do give her that space there is a likelihood that she will begin to understand your perspective better contrary to what she claims i believe that worldwide data would stand to prove that the bible has been more relevant for more men women than men even in today's world so in the long haul you may have to allow her to go and experience for herself the travails of feminism and that may bring her back to the balanced position of the divine design as found in scriptural teaching we have two questions my son was very obedient till he became a teen now he is rebellious and dis disrespectful as parents we are trying to be patient and loving what else can we do practically how to make a rebellious teenager understand parental love and genuine concern for them well i i am afraid that your patience and love may be causing the problem love in inverted commas you know our culture has wrongly equated love with approving everything true love must be tough if you have failed to be assertive you may have failed in your love true love seeks the highest good of the loved person without counting cost to self rebellion and disrespect must be dealt with firmly assertively and with the confidence of a world cup football empire no words no blowing up no argument but quick decisions followed by immediate firm action so inappropriate behavior must have consequences the son must lose certain privileges take care that you do not overreact in your response to your son's rebellion and dis disrespect as soon as you hear this answer it must be a carefully calibrated response that is agreed upon by both parents it may even involve severe measures such as stopping finance for his continued education when the teenager knows that you are the boss at home and that you really mean business they usually fall in line even as you do so try to spend more time with him and have a heart to heart talk with him to know what cost this change in behavior understand his heart and feelings so that you have a balanced perspective to address his issues once you are sure that your love for the rebellious teenager is true love tough love agape love you must also learn to leave the consequences to god and gain comfort from the fact that we being the people of god often fail to understand and appreciate god's love for us isaiah chapter 1 verse 3 says the ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib but israel does not know my people do not consider next question my 15 year old daughter remembers the beatings that she used to get as a young child when i disciplined her but she still holds a grudge against me and says that mummy is the reason for her problems 
I feel very hurt by this. What to do? There are multiple possibilities. One possibility is that the root cause of your daughter's anger may be something else. It may just be a passing teenage confusion and she may be trying to take that anger and grudge out against you because she cannot identify the real cause or she does not have the freedom to express the clamped up anger onto the real issue. That may be one possibility. The other, the second possibility is, you know, we are reminded in Ephesians chapter six, verse four, it says that you may be guilty of having exasperated her or unduly provoked her and unjustly punished her. So you too may have found your daughter to be an easy victim for your misplaced anger. If this is the case, you need to humble yourself and genuinely, genuinely seek forgiveness from your daughter. May God give you the grace to do that. The next question, can you differentiate between depression and mood swings? What are the signs that we should look for to know we need to get medical help? Depression is uh, very common among teenagers. So try to identify what the child finds most difficult to do. Provide some companionship and support in that particular area or subject. If it is a particular subject that is uh, causing uh, depression to the child. Help the child to arrange his room, help him to do his homework regularly and make up for the backlog of undone things. Have a daily exercise regime, go for walks, try having a pet if the child is keen on that. If mood swings occur at the same, at almost the same time every day, try eating some chocolate before the onset of the low feeling. Change in diet may sometimes help. Now, despite having tried all this, if the low feeling continues to linger and it, if it leads to anxiety, panic attacks, insomnia, hostility, restlessness, and extreme agitation or total inactivity, you should definitely seek medical help. We have two questions on the same topic. Is it okay for teenagers to have some interest and listen to secular music, especially English country music or pop music. Many of these have themes of romance or sorrow over failed relationships. Is it okay to expose them to these realities? How do secular music and movies negatively affect children? They are exposed to those at least in school, what to do? It is okay for teenagers to have some interest and listen to secular music of different genres. You know, the issue is one must not get addicted to any form of music. That we can derive that principle from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. As you have rightly stated in the question itself, romance and broken relationships are a reality of life. Many Psalms in the Bible are songs of sorrow and the song of Solomon is all about romance. So all these things have a rightful place. The key is to teach the child to evaluate the song from a godly perspective. 
what is this song trying to teach if you check my blog maturity foundation you will find three posts that are relevant to this these two questions the first post is an analysis of the hit tamil song kolaveri d a song about broken hearts uh, the second post in my blog is living holy in an entertainment saturated world and the third post that i would recommend you for reading is thoughts on contemporary christian music and worship now secular music and movies are definitely designed to maximize influence and so they do have a significant impact it is possible for you to introduce your teens to good movies and take time to evaluate them if your teens come home all excited that they have just got to see a fabulous movie listen them out ask them what was the aspect that they liked the most and why help them to process the information for example recently two medical students from my hometown trishur did a dance with a the song of rasputin by boniem as the background this 30 second video went viral now have you ever sat back to go to the lyrics of the song it speaks of the bible the preacher and the russians so try to discuss with your teenager what was the message of the lyrics and was it merely a nonsensical combination of words if so why has this song been so popular since the time it was first launched in 1978 so by questions like this you send the right message to your teenager that everything must be evaluated from the perspective of the world view that the bible gives to us the next question in my teens school the entire school has to participate in all programs for the school's annual day they had a class dance where they were dancing to a cinema song my child didn't want to stay away as she would be singled out and the school wasn't giving an option what to do in such a situation if your child wants to be a part of the dance team and if it was only you as parents who were not comfortable with it i think you may have to give in to the demand and make it a matter of prayer on the other hand if your child was genuinely not comfortable being a part of the dance team you may have to talk to the school authorities you know when i was in such situations during my college days i offered to be helping backstage and so nobody felt that i was not contributing my might uh, during such in class competitions i used to enroll for elocution debate painting instrumental music and so on at the same time being singled out in school or college is a reality that many believer boys and girls really face so we must teach them that this is part of the cross that they are called to bear we are called to be in the world but not of the world and we are called to be lights in this crooked and perverse generation john chapter 17 was 14 and 15 philippians chapter 2 verse 15 so i think it's not an easy situation but i think we have to learn to help your child process this 
Now we have a question on choosing a mentor. Is it okay to have mentors of the opposite sex, like a Sunday school teacher or someone? Can this lead to any other issue? I think it is always best and safer to have mentors of the same sex. But there may be exceptions based on specific issue for which mentoring is being sought. So discretion and wisdom must be exercised in such cases. We have another question on the same topic. How to identify a good mentor and his qualities? Can parents or family members be a mentor? A good mentor will be a person who has a proven track record of being trustworthy, godly, Bible-based, and not manipulative. He or she should be available for the mentee in the hour of need. The mentor should be a good listener and should keep matters confidential. The mentor should not be using men the mentoring relationship to meet his or her own emotional need. It is important that we know that our allegiance must be to God first, and the mentor should never be a person who exercises undue human authority over the mentee. The second part of that question says, can parents or family members be a mentor? You know, it is always preferable for one to have a mentor who is outside the family, but if there is a person within the extended family who satisfies the, the parameters that I've stated earlier, it would be fine to have a mentor within the extended family. Now we have a question on prayer and meditation. How do we tell our children that prayer and personal meditation, basically of the word of God, is of utmost importance in our lives? The best way to do so is to allow them to see how important prayer and personal meditation of the Bible is for you and how you are able to apply the word of God into the circumstances of your daily grind. You know, I sit with my seven-year-old granddaughter and enable her to meditate on a single verse and to record her one or two sentence thoughts in a journal using the cursive handwriting techniques that have been taught at school. So it is good to form these habits early in life. The next question, how do you motivate a child who is smart, but does not want to do his best? I think I must ask you a question first. Are you a perfectionist? by insisting that whatever your child does is nothing less than perfect, you may be inculcating a childhood injunction towards perfectionism that can later on become a hurdle in life. So will that end up in the child operating on exclusively binary options, either perfect or none. Sometimes the child may not like the struggle at the top where the competition for perfection ends up in unhealthy moves from fellow students. So I would encourage you to focus on enabling the child to be faithful rather than strive to be the best. But if the child is lazy and sim simply finds excuses not to do what he should be doing, 
I think we must encourage the child to use his potential and thereby please God. So help him to understand that hard work is a part of being faithful. Applaud the child for his hard work rather than for his intelligence or for being at the top. Do not expect from him what he is not capable of delivering. Each child in the same family may have different capabilities and aptitudes. And as parents, we should evaluate and understand this difference. We should not compare our children too much, but appreciate each one for the strengths that each one has been endowed with by God. We have another question, which is now very relevant. Teen asks questions on LGBT and homosexuality. How do you clarify that it is wrong when the world says it is okay? If you remember the session that I took about parenting of teenagers, I mentioned that the first lesson in the ICSC syllabus for standard two, the textbook, is a subtle way of preparing the child to accept the rainbow coalition or the LGBTQ. So when I saw that, I took time with my granddaughter who is just seven years old and who is in standard two. I took time to explain to her at her level what LGBTQ is all about, but I think for teenagers, we can talk a lot more on this subject. Uh, we live in a fallen world that is affected by sin. So some people are born with aberrations. The doctor assigns sex based on external appearance at birth. But later on in life, a scan may reveal that a boy has female internal organs or that a girl has testicles. Now, these are exceptional aberrations and they are not the norm, but they are a reality in life. Likewise, it is possible that genetic aberrations may have caused attractions that are not normal. You see, we are now living in the midst of this pandemic and we are aware of how quickly genetic mutations are taking place in the COVID-19 virus. Likewise, mutations and recombinations are always going on in the human genome too. In God's original design, God made humans as male and female, where the male is attracted to the female and vice versa. This is called straight or heterosexual. As a heterosexual, I have to keep my attraction towards the opposite sex subject to God-given directives in the Bible. Now, a person who experiences an attraction to the same sex must also learn to keep his or her attraction subject to God-given directives. So we must differentiate between homosexual attraction, whatever be its causality, and homosexual activity. Homosexual activity is sin just as adultery is sin for a heterosexual person. Homosexual attraction is a fallen world effect and must be subject to God's directives just as much as I, as a heterosexual person, must keep my attraction to the opposite sex under control. Gender dysphoria uh, which is the feel, feeling of being trapped in a wrong body and homosexual attraction are a reality in this fallen world. 
but homosexual activity is sin and the only alternative lifestyle for people affected by gender identity issues is to remain single to find support and if possible to find an understanding heterosexual alliance i recommend that you read the following books for further study uh that i am going to suggest three books number 1 understanding gender dysphoria by mark yan house it is written from a evangelical christian perspective number 2 embodied by preston sprinkle and number 3 love thy body by nancy percy all these books are available on amazon now i also have a more detailed article in my blog maturity foundation the title of the article is an Ev- evangelical response to the lgbtqia coalition we have another relevant question with regard to electronic gadgets how do we help our children not to succumb to peer pressure the use of gadgets is a reality of today's world and the time will come or already has come when many parents depend on the younger generation to navigate the use of these gadgets we live in an age where technology is changing so fast the cell phone you buy today will not be compatible with technology developed tomorrow so there is always the pressure to keep upgrading your gadgets when you buy a new device it is wise for you to go for one that is compatible with the latest technology available at the same time our purchase should be determined by our need and not by peer pressure our need should be determined by our use ultimately our purchase must be decided based on our budget to live within our means so if you involve your teens in the discussion of all these parameters i think they will better understand moreover you can always tell them that they can buy the gadget of their dreams when they begin to earn money for themselves or when they have accumulated enough of their pocket money for the purchase another question on gadgets please share some practical tips to help a child overcome gadget addiction i have already mentioned a few in my talk but i shall anyway repeat it here suggestion number 1 is to incorporate no screen only face to face talk time slots at home so this rule must be applicable for parents also uh, preferably meal times and maybe one hour before bedtime should be no screen time and should be only face to face talk time slots number 2 make alternatives to screen time you know indoor and outdoor games hiking camping exercise regimes swimming learning musical instruments arts craft painting cooking baking sewing all these things are possible alternatives number 3 make book reading and discussion an essential part of your routine let that be a culture of your family that each one of you will read a book and you will share your thoughts know that there are examples of people who have sacrificed screen time by having taken tough decisions i would recommend that you go back to the talk on 
parenting of teenagers where I spoke about Bill Gates. I gave my own example and also the example of a family in USA. Now, you can, you can definitely encourage profitable programs, but you must set aside specific time slots or days when those could be watched. So this is an ongoing struggle for all of us. And I think we must learn to uh, keep these things in God's purview rather than being addicted to gadgets. The next question, is it right to leave a teenager at home under supervision? Because the homes that we visit will have smaller children and they are not comfortable as it's boring for them to hear conversations of adults, mostly maybe for counseling. So I perceive that this question is a family that is uh, involved in ministry. Now, if the teenagers are left under supervision, say with other trusted church members or grandparents, it may be okay in a while, but not frequently. Older children of the home can be taught to be responsible to take care of the younger ones so that the parents can make such visits in times of need, such as counseling couples in conflict or visiting widows. I know one family who trained up their own teenage children to engage the smaller children of the house that they visit. Eventually, these teenage children learn to share the gospel and today they have become adults. And despite having had a professional degree and a good job, they have actually quit their job to be involved in ministry. So this may be an example at the good end of the spectrum. Each family is different. So there may be times when you may have to change the style of your ministry. Maybe instead of both parents going out for house visits, leaving the teenage children alone at home, each parent may have to take turns to remain at home. Alternatively, consider the new options that technology has opened up for us. Uh, you know, the possibility of Zoom meetings instead of physical house visits and so on. Ultimately, we must not forget 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, which exhorts us that we must provide for the physical, financial, emotional, and social needs of our own family. And if we do not do so, we will be worse than an unbeliever. How do we engage in conversation with a teenager who doesn't open up to parents? I have already mentioned in my session that the best advice that I can give to you is to grab that golden moment when he opens his mouth to say one word. When he opens his mouth, every other activity can stop and you must respond by being all ears. Also, you can watch the teenager's body language. If there is anything you find amiss, then you can try to prayerfully spend time with him trying to find out the reason for his silence. You can try to talk about subjects that matter to him it could be football, it could be gadgets, or it could be motorbikes. You know, at the same time, allow the child or the teenager to have his or her silent space. Evaluate if you are involving in unhealthy chatter that the child wants to avoid. So sometimes you may be the cause of the problem, learn to practice silence before God yourself. And in that silence, God may bring to your awareness many areas where you may need to work on so as to improve the atmosphere at home 
that your teenager feels free to express himself or herself. We have another similar question. How can I help a teenager who is always in the room, locked up, and doesn't like to talk to anyone at home? He says it's his personality and prefers to be that way. But we see that he's very friendly and talks freely with his friends. How do I help him open up at home too? Since he is uh, comfortable talking to people outside the home, try to arrange for him to have a godly mentor with whom he can talk openly, who is not from home, not in the family, somebody outside. It is normal for teenagers to seek some privacy. At the same time, I would like to draw your attention to two verses from the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 21, verse 9, and Proverbs 25, verse 24. These verses tell us that a contentious person in the house can drive others into a closed corner. So, have you always been critical and judgmental of your son? So examine if you have had a role to play in contributing to his wanting to have no interaction with others at home. It may be his defense mechanism to build a boundary from verbal and emotional abuse. If you have ruled out these possibilities, you can insist that, you know, he who does not talk to anyone else at home lives in the home as if it were a hotel room. That is not permissible. Such a son should not have the privilege of getting food, laundry done, and so on. So if you are ruled out other contributions, you can consider this option of confronting him, but before you do so, insist on talk times on a one-to-one -one basis before these privileges are dished out. And remember, love ought to be tough. Another question. Most parents have a good relationship with their preteens. But as they become teens, why does the relationships change? What are the factors that cause this? How to prevent this from happening? As I mentioned in my session, puberty brings with it a surge of hormonal activity. This in turn leads to confusion, identity crisis, and mood swings. If the parents had done a good job in the preteen years by building a strong connection with the child rather than merely focusing on correction, the shift in relationship would be less upsetting for both the parent and the child. The next question, I have heard some say, that it is easier to raise girls into godly teenagers and adults than boys. Is there any fact to it? Why does raising godly boys seem, at least on the surface level, more difficult? I think girls tend to mature a little faster than boys. And this may be the one reason for this perception that it is easier to raise up girls. However, that is not always true. When the father is actively involved in parenting, boys come out well. Some girls are far more strong-willed than some boys. So I don't think we should take this perception on its face value as applicable for everyone. It differs from child to child. The next question, if a parent has mistreated his child for the majority of their growing up years, 
and they themselves came to faith only when the child was a teenager, what steps must he or she take to mend the relationship with the teenager or young adult? The relationship must move from one of total dependence to one of being interdependent and in the independent. So having now come to the faith, it is possible for you to seek forgiveness for the mistakes that you made during the years of ignorance. The transition from being biologically related to being spiritually related can actually take a beautiful turn if this is done with respect and tenderness. Uh, in any case, the abuse that the child had to undergo from you when you were still not in the faith must be addressed completely and to the satisfaction of the child. I have observed firsthand how parents' continued hypocrisy led to the child's walking away from faith when he became a teenager. Now the parents want to make things right. What is to be done? I think there is very little that can be done to undo the damage that has already been done. All that I would advise is that the parents, that they would repent of their hypocrisy, make drastic changes in their own lifestyle and hypocritical ways, fast and pray for the salvation of their child. They have actually lost the right to witness to the child. So do not pursue the child yourself. Allow others to share the gospel to him as and when God allows. You know, demonstrate your love toward him in practical ways. That love must be without any strings attached. It must not be manipulative love. To borrow a thought from C.S. Lewis, may God be gracious to use the megaphone of suffering to bring your son to the feet of the cross. It may be academic failure, it may be a broken love affair, or it may be an accident or some illness. And when that happens, be humble and sensitive to the hand of God in your family. Another question. You mentioned in your talk that you didn't even have a newspaper in your house till your children were teenagers then how will they get awareness of what's happening in the world and develop interest in things like politics or sports? Such things cannot be developed overnight. For them to pray meaningfully and develop the right understanding, some exposure is required. Isn't it mandatory to have at least a newspaper at home? Thank you for asking this question because I think I probably need to clarify a few things. Uh, it was a personal choice that we made because I was addicted to newspaper reading and it took away too much of my time from far more important things that needed my attention at home. Now, I worked in an office where I would have multiple newspapers delivered to me. So I really didn't miss out on the headlines of what was happening in the world. Now, even though my children did not have newspaper until probably my elder daughter was in the eighth standard, after that, we did have the newspapers coming. And my daughters were very socially responsive, responsive when they were in school. You know, they led public protests against the war on Iraq. They agitated against the Coca-Cola company planned at Plachimada. They went all the way to Gujarat to join Medha Bhatkar in her Narmada Bachao Andolan. They debated with former Nexlite leader, 
on war and peace they interviewed the former kpcc president and so on so my children did not really uh, suffer because we didn't have newspaper in the early years of their life they were more involved in social issues than most children are now i want you to note that the purpose of my saying was that there was a time in my family when we opted to ban newspapers from home the intention of my saying that was that there are times when you have to take tough decisions to protect quality family time this is what we chose to do what you may be led to do may be to crub something in an altogether different area one family i know of has chosen to unplug their home television and to keep it in their store room because they realize how much the television was affecting quality family time so the purpose is protect what is more important by removing what is optional the next question please suggest some creative ways to engage teenagers to use their time and energy meaningfully apart from academics sports and games physical fitness programs hiking instrumental music being part of good song teams cooking helping out in event management volunteering for social service taking tuitions for underprivileged children being part of reading and discussion groups visiting the aged and sick and cultivating good hobbies as a teenager my hobbies were kitchen gardening and carpentry now i know that in lockdown times many of these options are limited but we may still be able to find out ways and means of doing some of these things online we have one last question in a family the parents separated just before the child became a teenager so in her teens she grew up with a single parent now she is in her mid 20s but has an aversion towards marriage she hates the concept of marriage and wants to be single how to counsel her and make her understand that god desires marriage for most with very few exceptions this is not going to be easy because her basic problem is that she can no longer trust anyone giving oneself in marriage is a lifelong commitment of trust she has to initiate some healing process and that has to come intentionally you now she can be part of a therapeutic group where she will be able to give expression to her fears and her unmet needs without fear of judgmental responses what we can do for her is to facilitate her being a part of a group of faithful trustworthy friends both male and female both married and single who will accept her as she is and give her the space to be single by choice and not always bring up the question of marriage if god allows her to witness and experience the love and friendship of open homes maybe she will be able to come out of her fears as the years go by she may heal and she may find a male friend with whom she is able to uh she may be open to consider marriage she must be given enough time to test the waters and build a relationship of trust with that person before the commitment to marriage is made now in the meanwhile we should remind her that there is actually only one married couple 
named in the New Testament as being actively involved in ministry, that is Aquila and Priscilla. On the other hand, the list of people who seem to have been single but actively involved in ministry is long. For example, if you take men, we read about Lazarus, Barnabas, Apostle Paul, Timothy, Titus, Ephaphroditus, and Luke. If you think about women, we read about Anna, who was, of course, a widow, Mary and Martha, Mary Magdalene, Joanna and Susanna, Feba, Ephrenia and Tephrosa. Now, we do not know for sure if all these people were single or married, but they have been listed here as if they were single. Some may have got married later on. Their ministry success could have been due to their faithful wives or husbands. All these possibilities are there. But it's important to note that as a single person, you can still be significant and find fulfillment in life. And let us not forget that into a world that was and still is so much engrossed with sex and marriage, Jesus Christ remained single and demonstrated that one can be single and yet fulfilled and happy in life. Now, because we have come to the end of the questions, from the questions that we have had, I felt it is important for me to introduce the blogs that I have because many of the questions are related to articles that I have posted in my blogs. I actually have four blogs, Maturity Foundation, which has many articles that will be relevant for youth, including real cases of romance in the believing community. So, you know, for example, the myth of romantic love and the confines of true love, or there's a case study, of course, I have changed the names where Asha and Ashish, uh, a case in the right direction, Anu and Anil, a case in the wrong direction, and so on. My second blog is about single but not alone. It has a few articles to support those who are born again believers, but who are still single. The third blog is Letters to Alice. These are actually a collection of letters that were written by Mrs. Betty John Kurian to her soon to be married daughters. And likewise, there is the fourth blog, Letters to Andrew, a collection of letters that were written again by Mrs. Betty John Kurian to a soon to be married nephew. Many young couples have used the letters to Andrew and Alice to guide their conversation prior to marriage and have found them immensely useful. Unlike most books that are available in the market, these letters are written from an Indian perspective. Now, I know that the links to these blogs will be given in the YouTube, but if you still want another way to find my blogs, I think the easy way out is to Google Alexander George Pilgrims. Pilgrims is the name of the church that I'm associated with. And when you do that, one of my blogs will come up on the list. Enter the blog, scroll down, click on view complete profile, and there you will get the links to all my blogs. So thank you very much for all your wonderful questions. God bless. Now that brings us to the end of this Q&A session. We would like to thank Alexander George Uncle once again for sparing your time and sharing your wisdom with us and help us understand and navigate through these questions. I hope and pray that these questions and answer session will be of much use to all of you.
to conclude, let me remind you once again, the next mom focus meeting is on the 23rd of May, 2021, Sunday, 3 p.m. Dr. Bina Sam will be speaking to us on the physiology of women, its changes and challenges. We invite all dear moms, young and old, all moms to be, and all of you to be part of this session and be blessed. Thank you once again. God bless you.